Thank you so much for having me. The food was delicious, so I really, I really appreciate everyone who put in the time and effort for, cooking for me. It was, it was really nice. It was really, um, I was just really touched by kind of the gesture. It was really, it was, it was wonderful. Uh, today I'm going to talk about something that maybe is not necessarily the thing you have on your mind when you're eating lunch, but <laughs> it is something important and it's something I get requested to ask to speak on all the time because it is so such a common thing. That's ticks the you know the ticks that we're dealing with and the diseases that they can potentially transmit, such as Lyme disease. Uh, and that, that Lyme disease is the most common. It is the most common tick-borne disease, or sorry, uh, arthropods, so including mosquitoes, the most common disease that humans suffer from um, pretty much worldwide. Uh, and so when but how common it is tends to fly a little bit under the radar. In fact, there was just a recent publication put out by the CDC last week just discussing how much uh, Lyme disease cases are grossly underestimated. So when people talk about having Lyme disease, occasionally they may feel alone in that or they may feel frustrated that this happened or they may feel like the only one, but you're not alone. There are many, many people that deal with Lyme disease. What I am here to talk about mostly is how to prevent that and to be one less person that gets Lyme disease. And it is possible, it's, it's definitely possible, and I'm trying to, and I want to teach you about all these different methods of understanding ticks, and then once you understand the ticks, you can prevent them. It's kind of like, you know, when you cross the street, if you understand that cars are going to be coming, and they travel in one direction, and if you stay on one side of the road, and there are stop signs, if you understand all of that, you can prevent it. You know, for the most part, being hit by a car. Of course, it can happen, but you really minimize that. If you don't know anything about traffic patterns and you just walk in the street, what do you think is going to happen, right? And so that's the way it is with ticks. Like a lot of people, we weren't raised where people talked about ticks and taught us. So that's my goal here today is to teach you about that, right? So let's start, let's talk. Let's begin with like a little scenario, right? So it's really nice outside. It's a little cold. Hope I heard that next week's going to be really warm, and really nice. So if you decide to go outside next week, I mean, this could be you, right? Thinking about going outside, maybe planning out your garden, doing some yard work, all these fun activities, taking a walk, spending time with your kids, spending time with your dogs. Um, I don't know if you wear, it doesn't really matter, honestly, but if this is something you wear, I don't judge. I mean, I wear, you should see the way I dress. Yeah, I know, but... But, at the end of the day, right, you come inside, and I will tell you this, if the temperatures are above 40 degrees, the risk of a tick encounter is very, very real. So if next week it's 40, 45 degrees, you may think it's too cold for ticks. I promise you, it is not, right? And when you come inside, you notice something maybe a little bit different. It might not be that day, it might even be the next day, or it might be when you get into the shower. Um, and it could bite you on a place that you don't really think is appropriate for anyone but maybe your doctor to see, right? So it could be one of these locations. And ticks, I know it sounds funny, but Ticks really do like to bite those spots, so it is really important that you, that you kind of notice these things, right? Um, and it's scary, right? You find it, and it's a tick. Oh no, oh my gosh. And a lot of things might be racing through your mind right now, right? Like, <clears throat> how did this get there? How long has it been there? Do I need to call my doctor? Am I gonna get Lyme disease? You might feel a little bit of guilt, like should I have been preventing this? I shouldn't have gone outside. I should have just been watching Netflix at home. I should have just been, you know, sitting on the couch taking a nap. But no, it, it, it's not your fault. And there are ways to prevent this. And you're not necessarily guaranteed to get Lyme disease. Um, but let's get into it, right? You know, Lyme, a little bit wired to this problem, right? Lyme, again, Lyme disease, very, very common. We estimate that about half a million cases of Lyme disease occur every year but about 95% of those cases occur in just 13 states. And the economic burden of Lyme disease is estimated at $3,000 per patient per year, right? So if I prevent just a few of you from getting Lyme disease, that like more than pays for my salary. I don't make a lot of money, right? <laughs> um, but yeah, and so that line, so you think about like, we're living in an area, we're living in one of those 13 states, even though it doesn't look like that. But we are, and, uh, <clears throat> It's something to be aware of, right? If you go to California, you know they have earthquakes. If you go oh, down, down, you know, kind of down south, like Texas and Oklahoma, you know, you've got tornadoes. It, it just, it, if you go down to uh, Florida, you've got crazy mosquitoes and you have people who live in Florida. So you have all these things <laughs> to deal with, right? But 
Lyme disease is, can be very serious. I mean, here's this woman, Olivera Marshall. She said, I was pretty healthy and fit and busy. Since this happened, her getting Lyme disease, I don't have that concentration anymore. Some days I struggle to read, write, or even speak. And there's this constant fatigue, right? So some people we know suffer from these persistent, long-term symptoms of Lyme disease. But there are 10 different diseases you can get from ticks um, that we know of, right? There are probably more that occur here in Massachusetts that we just don't know about yet. Um, and they're transmitted by different species. Lyme disease can only be, tra be transmitted by the deer tick. So if you're bit by a dog tick, you cannot get Lyme disease, right? Um, I thought I took these out, but we'll skip through these, because we only have 20 minutes. Um, <clears throat> those are some new ticks, right? So I want to talk about this, right? Today, speaking today, I am Lyme disease free, and I'm free of other tick-borne diseases, and I have not been bit by a tick in over 30 years, right? So it is possible, and I do lots of things outside. Here, I mean, um, I'm hiking up a mountain right here. I conduct tick surveillance. I go around and I look for ticks, and I may collect as many as this many ticks in a jar, and I still have not been bit by a tick. I've been doing this job for seven years. I collect ticks like this. I might collect this many ticks um, maybe 30 days throughout the year. Don't come home with a single tick on my body, right? So it is possible, right? If you just know the behavior of ticks, where they are, how to understand them, and you use the proper protection methods on your body, right? It's not luck, it's science, right? I'm not a lucky person, right? I'm probably the only person you'll ever meet that has bet money on Tom Brady and lost every single time, right? <laughs> I, I've tried it a few times, right? And you say you're not a gambling person over here. I'm not normally, but I'm like, how do you lose when you bet on Tom Brady? And you do. <laughs> so that is, that is, that's me. But I'm a scientist, right? And I trust the science, I trust the data. Um, so let's start with personal protection, right? Ticks can sense animal activity. This tick right here, it does not have eyes. It can't see you at all. It doesn't know where you are. That means it doesn't climb trees and jump down and fall on you. It doesn't perch on plants and jump at you. It has no idea where you are in three-dimensional space, right? It just hopes that you walk into it in the same way that poison ivy, can, you know, poison ivy doesn't jump at you. You have to brush into it, right? You have to get the oils on you. Ticks are very much the same way they hope that you walk into it, right? Because they have this claw that they use for latching onto skin, fur, clothing, um, even rubber, right? So this is a rubber boot that I put together this video with um, some folks from Norwell. And we have a climbing rubber boot. So some people, especially gardeners, um, and people who fish and hike, they think that if they wear rubber boots, that the ticks will not be able to climb up. And then they have a tick on their body and they say, well, it must have fallen out of a tree because it couldn't have climbed this rubber boot. And so that's their logic. And it's a, if you use the wrong practices, it's, it's leaving the door open for the ticks to come in, right? If you think all the doors in your house are locked and your back door is not, you say like, Oh, the, the thief must have a key to my house, but your back door is unlocked, right? So you, you, let, you can't let any of the doors in your house be unlocked, right? So let's gonna start with repellents, right? We call these repellents, but they don't actually repel the tick. It's a little bit of a misnomer. What they do is they prevent that tick from detecting where you are. So if the tick has no eyes, it uses its sense of smell, which are located on the ends of its arms, believe it or not, sounds kind of weird, there are things called howler's organs, they're little pits in the arms. And uh, this, these repellents, they fill in those pits, they fill those pits, right? They fill them with, with scent and they block the ability for that to scent. If you were to fill this room with perfume, you wouldn't be able to smell that delicious food over there, right? <laughs> so it's the same way, the repellents work like that perfume, preventing that tick from smelling you, preventing that tick from knowing that you're even around. And so the tick just thinks, Nothing's around. I'm not going to get excited. I'm not going to move around my arms. I'm just going to stay right here. So that's how they work. You don't need more than 20%. And these are the ingredients that you're looking for. It doesn't matter what brand you get. You can get off. You can get the store-bought brand, the generic brand. Does not matter. These have to be EPA registered. So that means they pass a screening where they're assessed for safety and effectiveness. So the brand has no sweat, right? It does not matter. Just get the cheapest one. And the ingredients, the, these three ingredients all work the same as long as you have about 20%, you reach the maximum amount of repellency. 100% does not protect more than 20%, right? 20% is the cap. And all my kids at home, I've got a three-year-old and a five-year-old, I use 
because you don't have to use the most, right? You can just use 7%. If they're playing in the yard, that's enough, right? They're not going into the deep woods, hiking out, trying to get to these fishing spots. They're three and five, and they're playing tag, right? They're not, they're, you don't need that, right? Um, here's another product, it's called Permethrin, and this is different uh, than a repellent, right? So you, you spray this on your clothes, never your skin, so it's a treatment for fabrics. But you can do like backpacks, you can do socks, you can do shoes, you can do blankets, you can do any kind of fabric, right? And this, it will actually kill any of the ticks that, that touch that fabric. So you can see it doesn't kill right away, but the tick will actually fall off and that tick's actually paralyzed. So it's a pesticide. So if you think about how you do a yard spray, and that will kill the ticks and prevent the yard spray, prevent the ticks from coming into your yard, this is something that's similar that you can put on your clothing. So it only, it, it's, not, it's not harming things in the environment, it's only protecting the ticks that would touch you, that would get onto you. And it doesn't rub off on the plants or anything and let, if it's dry. If it's wet, it, it can, but as long as it's, you wait for it to dry, it's a little bit of a process, but this is my process. I spray my clothes, my shoes, my family's clothes and shoes, the first weekend of every month. And the stuff is good for a full month or, or like six washings, right? So it lasts, so I mean, that's, that's pretty much a month. month. I get this in the routine, first weekend of every month, I spray it and I leave it out to dry overnight. And then I bring it in, it's good for that full month. Um, again, this is kind of covering it. Um, this is a little video, it's, it's really simple. I, I put together this video because people ask me, they're like, well, how do you use it? And I'm like, it, it's really simple. You just put the shoes down or whatever you want to spray. You spray it until it looks a little bit wet, and that's it. And you just let it dry, right? That, that's all you do. And then you, now you have clothing and shoes that are anti-tick, that are protective. And you know, my wife and my kids, they don't even know I do this. I just do it, and then they don't get ticks. And they're, they're like, you're, they're running around like, Oh, you know, you just have that peace of mind, right? Knowing that. Um, keep cats away until it's dry. This is a product that cats have a sensitivity to, right? But only the wet product, right? So only when it's wet. So that's why I spray it outside. The cats are kept indoors. This is a very low, low concentration, right? And we know that cats have a sensitivity when it's a high concentration, but we don't want to take chances for low concentrations either of them. Um, treatments for cats and dogs, speak with your veterinarian. Um, the, stu the stuff that you would put on this, I know it looks like a cat, but it's not a cat. It's actually a small dog. Um, this is 50% permethrin. The stuff on the outside of your clothes, half a percentage, right? So this is, what, like 100 times more concentrated that you would smear on the dog's skin? You cannot smear that on a cat's skin, right? So it, it's important, right? So we're keeping the half a percent away from cats, keep the 50% away from cats too. It's okay for dogs, but not cats, right? Okay, interesting. Counterfeit products, especially with a lot of online shopping, really, really important. A lot of people come in and they talk about how these Sarasa collars harm their dogs. It was a big news story, but what we're realizing is that a lot of these collars are purchased online through online sources, Walmart, Amazon, and they're filled with third-party suppliers that are just selling fake products, right? And some of them don't work, and some of them are not manufactured properly, right? So like, we have here some instances of some fake and real collars here. Um, check yourself and your pets. Very, very important. How do I know I haven't bit, been bitten over 30 years? I check myself every single day. We know that the transmission of Lyme disease from the point where a tick bites you until the point where you could get it, it never seems to happen in less than 24 hours, right? So if you're checking yourself every day, you will catch that tick before it has a chance to transmit those germs into your body, and you can pull it off. And even if the tick bit you, past all those defenses, you you won't get you probably won't get Lyme disease. The odds are very much in your favor. So the tick checks are very very important for parts on your body, especially I know for those that may not have someone to check their back or behind their ears. You know, mirrors can help, but also use your fingertips. Your fingertips. Uh, I'm noticing that some people here wear glasses. They might have trouble seeing these ticks. Fingertips are more sensitive than eyesight for most people. And I use my fingertips most of the time anyways, before I get in the shower, just feel around my, your body. It, especially, you know, and especially, you know, it could be a mole or it could be a skin tag or it could be a scab, but all these things are important to get checked out anyways, so you might as well know where they are. Um, you know, this is just some examples of how many people don't, don't check themselves. Nine out of 10 people, 90% of people basically do not remove the nymph tick in less than 24 hours. 
and in this one, 81% of people <coughs> who have had Lyme disease um, never remember being bitten. Right? So a lot of people aren't doing tick checks. It's pretty disgusting. How do you do a tick check? Again, we talked about uh, feeling with your fingertips. What areas of your body do you check? Um, you can Google this, but I'm going to tell you there is not a spot on your body that a tick can't bite as long as you have a skin. So it can bite like your knuckles, it can bite behind your ears. And I know a lot of people will say like, more commonly, yes, they are found lower back, um, like your, kind of your bum cheeks or behind your legs, things like that. All these areas that are kind of warm and sweaty, foreheads behind your neck, behind your ears, those are more common. But instead of remembering all that, you can have a tick bite you anywhere. It could be, again, your knuckle, it could be your elbow, it could be any of these things. It, it, as long as there's skin, that is a spot that a tick can bite. So you want to check everything. I don't think it's particularly helpful to know the common places that ticks bite. Um, if you still get bit, it's actually okay. You just want to pull it up properly, a pair of tweezers, grasp it firmly, pull straight up. Um, if you do leave behind what we call the head, um, it's not really the head, it's actually just a long straw-like mouth part. Um, you can see it's covered in these barbs. That can be anchored very firmly in your skin, and it's very skinny, so if that breaks off, it's actually um, not going to continually transmit Lyme disease. It just is a little bit like a splinter at that point. So you might want to treat it like a splinter, like it could become infected like splinters do, but it's not gonna, a splinter is not going to give you Lyme disease. And the same thing with this head, it's not going to give you Lyme disease. But it could become infected, so if you want to take it out, you can, or you could just you know, cleanse that with some antibacterial stuff, Neosporin, Vasotracin, and just leave it. Especially if it's like a dog that got a tick, or like if my three-year-old boy got a tick, I'm not going to sit there trying to dig out this bar object underneath the skin when he's already crying, right? So you just pull it off, put it like a frozen or like a Transformers Band-Aid on it, and just like send him on his way. <laughs> what do you do for yards? Um, deer ticks require very high humidity. If you brought a deer tick indoors today, it would probably die within a couple of days. They need 82% humidity and up. That's a very, very, very humid, right? We were going to see that um, like around April and in May and in times like that, but this time of year it's very, very dry. Um, but we do find ticks uh, very commonly near these forest edges, right? About 10 feet from the forest edge is the rule of thumb when you're thinking about where you're going to find ticks. And it doesn't need to be a full forest, it could just be a stand of trees. If you have like six or seven trees and they provide shade in an area and they drop leaves down, that's a forest from this regard. And 10 feet from that, around that, is, going to, is where you're going to find the ticks. That's because you have these animals, your ticks feed on over 150 different species of animal, and um, the shade from the shrubs and the trees and the leaf litter is going to provide all the habitat that these ticks need to survive. We find that 70% of Lyme cases occur from people spending time in their backyards. So they are not necessarily from you hiking in the woods or from you going on a camping trip. They're from you taking your dog out for, to go to the bathroom, having a barbecue with your family, playing frisbee, playing hide and seek, doing some gardening. You know, all these active come mowing the lawn. All these things when people have their garden that let down are when people are getting Lyme disease, most of the cases, right? And again, just kind of nail home the 10 people from the forest edge. They did some studies where um, they mowed half a trail, and you can see these trails are about, you know, no matter, and no matter where they mowed or where they let the grass grow really tall, there were ticks across the entire trail. Didn't, again, it didn't matter if the grass was short, didn't matter if the grass was tall, but what you do see is that these trails are very, very narrow. They're not, if you wanted to walk in the center of a trail and not, be, not encounter ticks, that would have to be like over 20 feet wide, right? Because then you're going to be not less than 10 feet from forest edge either, in either case, right? And again, right here, most trails are not built like that. This is me walking Plymouth. That trail, you know, you're, there's going to be ticks all along this trail. Um, leaves and snow protect ticks from cold. So if you are someone who has, has a yard and you have not done your yard work yet, <laughs> um, just be cognizant that those areas, there could be ticks underneath those leaves and snow. Like when you look at the study, you can see that the minimum temperature, air temperature, dropped down to minus 9.4 degrees Fahrenheit, but underneath the leaves and snow, the temperature probe read 26.6 degrees Fahrenheit. So even though that temperature spiked down below minus, almost minus 10 degrees, it was still very much, much, like a lot warmer for ticks. Like ticks will start dying when it gets down to about 13 degrees Fahrenheit. So, I mean, it's gotta drop well below minus 10 to have a noticeable impact on any of the ticks underneath the leaves and snow. But when you, if you remove the leaves, 
-hmm. then those ticks will succumb to that cold. So, but if you haven't done it yet, and I know, again, a lot of gardeners, a lot of landscapers want to leave the leaves. Leaves provide a lot of nutrients for the soil, and they provide a lot of homes for other insects and, and bees and, and spiders and things like that. So it is good, but just be aware of when you're doing this, right? And be cautious of where you pile your leaves, because any of those places that you pile leaves, again, are going to provide sanctuary for any of the ticks to survive the winter. Chemical yard sprays, very contentious topic. Just going to briefly cover it because a lot of people, I'm going to let you do, you do you. I'm not going to tell you what to do, right? Um, but know that this is kind of like the Wild West and there's a lot of opportunity for people to scam you out of money. Um, and it can and does happen all the time. So I'm going to tell you what you should be paying, where it should be happening, and how many times you should get a yard spray. It should cost about $100 to $150 per yard spray. If you go to the store, if you go to Lowe's or Home Depot, it will cost you about $30 to $40 to do it yourself, right? So you're paying someone a lot of money for about 30 minutes of their work. This is why it's a very lucrative profession, right? People are making $110 for half an hour's worth of work. That's pretty good. That's a lot more than I make. That's, yeah. that's pretty darn good, right? Um, I know a guy, and when I started this job seven years ago, he said he exclusively did this. He's retired now. And that's, that, that, that's, what, that's how much money you make, right? Um, when do you spray? You only need two yard sprays. If you're just controlling ticks, two per year. That's all you need. If they're charging you for four or five or six sprays, putting you on a regimen, again, they're charging you for the extra $110 or $150 four more times for sprays that do nothing, right? They're just sprayed in the environment and that's it, right? If anything that kills ticks will also harm other things. If they say it's an all natural organic pesticide, that will also impact bees, that will also impact everything else if it is also killing ticks. Or the opposite is true, some of these all naturals don't do anything. And then they won't kill the bees, but they also won't kill the ticks. And they'll cost you still about $200 a pop, right? When do you get these sprays done? Early mid-May, early mid-June, two sprays, that's it. That's all you need. The spray lasts about four weeks, and it's gonna kill the, the middle life stage, the nymphal life stage. And that nymph turns into the adults, that emerge in the fall. So you're killing the, the, middle, the middle stage, which is the most risky stage. You're not getting the peak in the fall either. And, the, and the, the, basically the spray is effective that full, for that full time, right? If a tick still bites you, don't Google symptoms. Uh, I'm not a medical professional. I don't know if there are any in this room, but um, Google is not gonna make you a medical professional, right? You need to go to school for that, right? Um, gather evidence. Record the date that you were bit, and try to get the species of the tick that you were bit. If you're bit, take the tick off, stick it under scotch tape. If you have a calendar on your wall, stick that tape on the date of the, you were bit on the calendar. The onset of these symptoms happens on average about 14 days after the time that you were bit, right? So if you go to the doctor, if you're like here, right? And then like, um, you know, you, you start feeling sick, you're like, maybe it was here. But if 14, you, maybe, maybe someone in this room is sick. I mean, hopefully not, right? But you're we're in a social gathering, right? But if you are 14 days ago, you were bit by a tick, that's important to tell your doctor, right? So if your doctor says, oh, you feel like you have the flu. Oh, were you, you were out of daycare around kids. Were you hanging with, like, it, it could be that. But if you say, no, doc, I was bit two weeks ago, now the doctor's gonna change what they're thinking. They're gonna say, oh, it could be something different now. So it's important evidence. Why does species matter? Because as we went over, not every tick transmits Lyme disease. And if you don't know how to identify the tick, there are other people that can do that for you. Um, go online, go to the University of Rhode Island's Tick Spotters, take a picture, submit it online, and they'll get back to you pretty darn quick. And they almost have like basically 24 hour service. And they're very, very good at what they do. Um, Unless you're me and you send them weird ticks and you try to trip them up, and it, does, it, it does work sometimes. Um, tick testing, um, you can send the tick off to get tested. It costs $50 a tick. Um, the doctor's not gonna use this, but what can be helpful around this is some people are just curious, and it actually does help the scientific community knowing where these diseases are. You can see here a woman was bit, and she was found, this tick was found with two different pathogens, two different germs. One of them causes something called babesiosis, and that's typically treated with a different medication than the one that is used for Lyme disease. So she went into her doctor and she said, Doc, I was bit by a tick with, that was carrying Lyme disease, it was carrying babesiosis. The doctor's gonna say, well, it doesn't mean you have both of these, 
but they might now the babesiosis could be on that doctor's radar, and if she's not responding to the treatment, they, they or they might test for both. You know, who knows? The doctor's going to make that decision, but it could be information that would guide that doctor. Any rashes, take pictures. Um, these are both the rash that you can get from having Lyme disease. They call it the bullseye rash, but that doesn't look like a bullseye. It's still the bullseye rash, right? They call it the bullseye rash. Take a picture of any rashes that you have. Show your doctor, especially if they get particularly large. This rash can grow up to about 10 inches in diameter. Ooh. So it start, can start out small, and it's not always a spot that you were bit. You could be bit again on your knuckle and have the rash on your back, right? Mm -hmm. The rash, show, the rash is from a systemic infection. It's when the infection gets into your bloodstream and then the infection comes back out in your skin tissue. So it, it can travel to different areas around your body and show up in many different locations. Um, and last but not least, with the right knowledge and awareness, my goal, my hope, is that you find that tick-borne diseases are preventable. At this point, I'll take any questions and I will respond to the questions. Yep. You mentioned a lot of chemical treatments, but what about some of the natural treatments like, you know, peppermint oil and cinnamon oil and that sort of thing? Yes. Are they effective? They can be, mm -hmm. but you don't know. So with the chemical treatments, so they are still chemicals. And so as a chem, you know, when you think from a chemist's perspective, it water is a chemical, right? right. Um, so they are still chemicals. The ingredients in those are still chemicals. They be. Plants have very potent toxins in them. Uh, for instance, the permethrin, that's sort of derived from a toxin created in chrysanthemum plants. Um, we've taken that and modified it heavily, but originally it was from chrysanthemums. Um, so some of these chemicals, what we know, at least in the literature, is that if you formulate them and you mix them properly, they can have an impact on ticks. Um, it's generally more temporary, doesn't last as long, or it's weaker. It depends very heavily on the formulation and the ratios of how you formulate these. Like they've, for instance, there were a few studies where they tested each individual ingredient alone and it had no effect. And when they mixed them together in a certain way, it did have an effect. When you go to the store, when you purchase these, there is no regulation around them, which means that someone selling you this product has no, other than their moral obligation, has no legal obligation to sell you a working product. So that's why I don't recommend them, is because you are putting your money and your trust in that manufacturer. And if you don't know them, and you don't believe that they're, gonna sell, that they're true to their word, you could be getting nothing, right? Or you could even be getting something that could harm you, or cause an allergy, or have an allergen. Like some of these products have known carcinogens, or they're toxic to, to, to animals. Um, and again, they're not regulated, so you don't know. Versus the ones that I'm rec recommending, they are regulated, so they do go through a screening process. And we do know some of their side effects and some of their effects. So the, the, the all naturals, we don't know their effects, um, and I guess we assume that they just don't have any. But that's that's those are the natural ones. So if you make your own and you find a formulation like you you can distill these, you can make your own. That's one thing. Then I say go for it, right? You do you. Anything that prevents ticks, you do you. Chris. Oh. Yep. My husband was very sick with Lyme disease, hospitalized, time check. Yes. And then had the specific um, treatment for that. Yes. But long term, is arthritis, oh, if you already have arthritis, yes. and long term, um, do you get a different kind of arthritis? They don't know. Um, the, the long term Lyme, and some people call it post treatment Lyme, some people call it chronic Lyme. <laughs> There's a doctor, a cheeky doctor I know who just calls it partially treated Lyme. Um, they are, doctors and scientists are completely unsure of what causes those symptoms, right? Um, because there is, it's very difficult to figure out what's causing those symptoms. So the bacteria, when it gets into your body, a lot of these symptoms can be from an inflammatory response, which is not the bacteria causing the symptoms, it's your body's immune system reacting, causing the symptoms. So when you still have these symptoms after you've been treated, is it because the bacteria is still in your body, or is it because now you're, you now have an autoimmune disease caused by the presence of a bacteria that is now gone? 
And because when you run these tests, sometimes the test, it, the test is only looking for antibodies, which are going to be there. From, so it's not looking for the bacteria itself. So you, unless there, and, and you can do, look for the bacteria, but you'd have some, it's, sometimes it's very invasive, and sometimes it's not possible or it's not accurate. Like you could do like a spinal tap or something, looking for the bacteria, but it's not completely accurate. And then you might find the bacteria, but who knows, right? Or you can look at some, like they've done like things where like post, um, like they've done like an autopsy on someone with like brain tissue and found it. But you're not gonna know that, like you look at my brain and see if I'm suffering from arthritis. Like, um, so we're not sure. What I would recommend when it comes to chronic Lyme or post-treatment Lyme or any of these is that um, if it's not bothering you, um, don't worry about it too much, right? And any of the things that are helpful for arthritis, continue to do. If you find that stress brings out some of these symptoms, try to stay relaxed and try to stay happy. Um, because if you start overthinking, um, if we know that stress might bring out some symptoms or some of these, start overthinking, do I have Lyme, what should I do? That could kind of could complicate the situation. So. Um, some people say, I was bit by a tick 20 years ago, and now I feel like I have arthritis. Maybe you just have arthritis, you know? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And then he had it again, the second time. Yeah. That time I saw Oh, sorry to hear. You should have your husband, you should tell your husband, bring home some of my information. Oh, this is your husband. <laughs> yes. So you should bring home some of my information. And I'm glad you showed up. I hope that, um, I hope that I was able to help you. Um, uh, he, Blake is available for questions if you want to do one-on-one. -on -one. Um, and I'm just curious, how many of you know somebody who has had Lyme disease? Exactly. Um, I grew up in the South, and one of the greatest preventions from Lyme, for Lyme disease is having a possum in your yard. <laughs> Possums eat ticks. Yes, okay? And even though they're creepy, um, uh, but they do. They're kind of, they do it all at night. They're, they're nocturnal creatures. But possums eat ticks and all those critters you don't like. So um, they're pretty cool animals that way. Um, you have lots of stuff to share. There are creepy pictures of tick or samples of ticks up here. Real ticks up here that you can look at. Um, I have certainly learned a lot because I'm out in my yard a lot. I mow my own grass. I garden a lot, all of that. And I'm sure I'm, I'm looking around the room. A lot of us do that too. And it does kind of flip me out. Yes. Thinking about it. My mother used to, if she saw a tick head, she would burn it yes. with a match. And so they had a, a kind of a southern regional way of doing dealing with that. <laughs> you know, if we're on your skin, they were they yeah. put kerosene. So you know, so it was it was like home it's remedies. But that's what if you lived in the country, that's what you had to do. So. Oh, yeah. It's a different germ. It's a different. It's a bacteria. It's a different. That's what you had. Rocky Mountain spotted fever. Yeah. Oh, wow. Did you get that here? I hadn't been there. So, oh, yeah. Wow. Been there. <laughs> so yes, I know. Well, it's called the Rocky Mountain spotted fever, but it's actually not found the most around the Rocky Mountains. That's where that's where it was identified, right? So it's actually found. It's found around there, but like upper Midwest is kind of where you would find it. Um, I do know one person here that lived in. Um, they lived in Brockton, who got Rocky Mountain spotted fever. So uh, that's what I was curious. Is like if you have lived in Brockton and you punch out the Yeah. So it, it's uh, there must be a pocket of that around here, spread by deer, spread by um, dog ticks. So not spread by deer ticks, spread by dog ticks. Dog ticks. Oh, and everybody knows why Lyme disease is called Lyme disease. Lyme Connecticut, that's yeah. where it was going yeah, yeah. 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 to be. L-Y-M-E. L-Y-M-E. Right off the 95. Uh -huh. That's where oh. it's from. So, Blake, we have another question on that side. Yeah. yeah. They're working on a vaccine of some type, aren't they? They're always working. Like, <laughs> since the 90s, they've been working. So, like, what it is, is, like, the vaccine with Lyme is, is mostly political and based on money. We can make one. We can have one tomorrow people wanted one, or if the people making one wanted one or thought it was profitable. So that it always gets, it's basically hung up on, does a company think that they can make, yes. What do you call the grease of society? Yes. Money is the grease of civilization. Yeah, the grease, the grease of civilization. So they, that, it needs that. Um, we had one in the 90s and it was taken off the market pretty much for money reasons only. And then they've been close a few times in the past few years, but I guess it's been kind of stuck.
stopped at the because they don't think they're getting the nice job with taping. Okay, I need to ask us um, yeah. uh, to you can sit around and visit if you want to, but our our hosts need to come in and clean and stuff like that. And Lake's available for Q and A. Okay. Yeah. 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 Yeah.